Hello and welcome to Church at Home. My name is Kev and I am the youth worker here at Holy Trinity. It's wonderful to have you with us this morning. In Church at Home this morning, James is going to be continuing our short series looking at believers who are suffering in isolation. And today we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul. Before we move into our time of worship, a big thank you to everyone who gave food items so generously uh, during harvest. Trevor called up with Laura, a worker at Philwood Hope, to find out how the food will be used to help those they work with. Okay, so it's great that I'm here at Philwood Hope with Laura, and I was just going to ask you, Laura, a couple of questions, if that's all right. Um, first of all, what's the main work that you do here at Philwood Hope? So here at Philwood Hope, we run as a drop-in centre for advice. So we advise people in the local area and further afield of any issues that they've got, mainly benefits, debts, housing, um, crisis. But anybody who comes through the door, we try our best to, to help them. That's great. And um, uh, this is uh, a gift from us from our Harvest uh, first Festival. Um, what sort of situations are people in that they need food like this from you? Okay, so most people that come through our door are um, normally on some kind of benefit or they've just been made redundant and they need to claim benefits. So this is a, a great kind of bridge for them. We can help supply them with food before they can get to the food bank if they've got some kind of crisis like benefit stops or something like that. So yeah, we run as a food cupboard, we call ourselves, that we can provide food until they can get further support. Great, so a food cupboard, that's brilliant. Yeah. Okay, and finally, um, in what way has coronavirus changed what you do or how you do what you do? Okay, well unfortunately we've had to close our doors for, for quite a while. We're just recently starting to reopen them um, Monday and Tuesday mornings. So we're doing a lot more over the phone and email inquiries, which unfortunately means we're probably not reaching out to as many people as we, we normally would because we've not got people just dropping in. And um, we're really missing our volunteers that would be here for a, a, a listening ear sometimes. Okay. Well, we just want to encourage you. We think you do a great job. And uh, yeah, so it's with love from us at Holy Trinity and keep up the good work. We are really grateful. Thank you ever so much. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.
today's Bible reading comes from Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realised that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful to us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's the children that I'm worried about with this whole COVID thing. And uh, particularly the larger families, I think, because with this rule of six, particularly as we draw near to Christmas, there's a real danger. Because of course, if there is a house that has already got six people in it, then Santa won't legally be allowed to visit that house this Christmas. I know. Well, I'll let you into a secret. I'm not actually worried about that. But it is true, isn't it, that COVID has transformed our lives and that we have had to adapt. We've had to learn to live differently because of it. And I guess a penetrating question for any Christian is about how well we've adapted as being disciples of Christ at this time. I was thinking a bit about this as I read this bit of scripture we've just had read to us now from Acts chapter 16. Uh, it's amazing, Paul, the Apostle Paul on a mission trip. Uh, he's got some companions with him, including Luke. Now Luke is the man who wrote the book of Acts, but he's also got with him a man called Silas, Great name, that. And all seems to be going well. They're making progress. So they've already had a prominent woman in Philippi, where they are, who has come to faith. 
a lady called Lydia. Great name, that. But then, suddenly, bang, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. Their plans interrupted. Their freedom taken away. Their support structures disappear. And their lives are turned upside down. Well, our predicament has some similarities with that. Of course, it wasn't a virus that Paul gave Paul his confinement, and thankfully we're not in prison. But we have had our plans interrupted. We've had some of our freedoms taken away. How should we adapt as Christians? And what can we learn from how the Apostle Paul adapted? And that's what we're going to think about. And so I've got for us two thoughts from God's Word that I hope are going to help us. So here's my first thought. Worship whenever and wherever. Now, why do I say that? That we should worship whenever and wherever? Well, what's your first reaction when something goes wrong? I'm guessing it's not to immediately praise God. Well, it may not have been Paul's first reaction either after he was thrown into prison. But by midnight, he was praising his socks off. Now, I've spent some time in a prison cell and I can tell you it is not a comfortable place to be. Um, just to clarify, in case there's any confusion, um, this was when I was doing work experience with the police force. And one of the police officers thought it would be rather amusing to lock some of us in a prison cell for a few minutes. Obviously, it was very funny. Well, I have to say that if I had been stripped, beaten with rods, thrown into prison, and had my feet locked in some stocks, I would probably be sobbing rather than singing. Which makes Paul and Silas quite remarkable. But let's just make sure we know what is going on here. Let me read from verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Well, we're told there that Paul and Silas pray and sing, but we're not told what they prayed or sung. Now, it could be that they were singing really great upbeat songs full of energy and joy. Maybe. Or it may be that they were singing songs of lament and sorrow and prayers that came from a heavy heart. We just don't know. But we do know that true worship comes from our hearts. So genuine worship isn't just forcing out a happy song, even when we're not happy. Genuine worship is when our hearts offer to God ourselves. And that's why sometimes it, uh, it can be hard when a song or a hymn has some words that, well, are a bit naff. Or perhaps the tune of a song doesn't quite reflect our heart and at times like that it can be hard to sing. Sometimes we need to ask God to bring us to a place of praise and sometimes he does that graciously. Sometimes we need to sing a different song because true worship is taking who we are and our own heart and simply offering that to God. And so who knows what Paul and Silas were singing and what prayers they prayed, but I'm sure it was genuine worship. And those listening in will have heard two people who were declaring God is great, that God is good, that God cares, and were just pouring out their hearts to him. And they would have seen that wonderful fellowship of believers enjoying spending time with their God. What particularly strikes me is how well they adapted their worship to their new environment. 
Now, we don't know what their normal worship environment was. Uh, it would be great to imagine, wouldn't it, that perhaps back at mission camp, where the team would gather with the new converts to Christianity, that they would worship, maybe around a campfire. And probably not, but imagine someone pulling out a guitar and then praising the Lord in their beautiful place, a Mediterranean evening with the beautiful surroundings and countryside, praising the Lord whilst all within the context of being on mission. Can you imagine how exciting that time of worship would have been? But nothing like that for Paul and Silas. They've been injured, thrown into prison, and there's not a worship group in sight. But they adapt. Well, we're in the midst of a pandemic and we need to adapt. We can't worship and sing and pray in church quite like we used to. It's different. Will we adapt? Some people perhaps will only ever have prayed and sung in church. For those of us who are used to praying and singing at home, how well have we adapted to our new circumstances? Um, I've thought of, I've known of um, uh, married couples who've never really spoken about their faith and of families who've never really spent any time praying about anything together. It's not deliberate, it's just the way things have evolved. But now is a fantastic time to reevaluate, to think about our worship, and to realise with Paul and Silas that we can worship whenever and wherever. And right now, that's probably most likely for us to be at home, and we need to think about our worship at home. So, if you live in a household with other believers, why not share something that you learned from your Bible reading that day? Why not choose a song and enjoy it together? Why not mark out some time to pray about something, whether at mealtimes, bedtimes, other convenient times? And if you're on your own as the sole Christian in a house, well, don't let that stop you either. Grab a Silas to join you, maybe in person, maybe on Zoom, maybe on the phone. Someone who you can just talk to, share something that you treasure about Jesus. Us Brits tend to be quite private about our faith sometimes, but I'm glad Paul and Silas weren't. Can you imagine them sitting there in this prison cell? and them both sort of looking slightly awkwardly. If we're going to sing, we better do it under our breath. But I'm glad that they sang out. I'm glad that they enjoyed that moment of worship together. And how wonderful that others were able to listen in. It's one of the wonderful things when unbelievers get to see a genuine worshiping heart and they get to see our joys and our tears lived out in faith, in the presence of God. And sometimes I think, uh, I meet some Christians who think that um, they should present the perfect image to those who aren't Christians. You know, the sort of thing you have to pretend that you're absolutely fine, your faith is perfect, you have no questions and you're not struggling. Well, of course, there's no such thing and, uh, you know, people can uh, smell a rat and see what's fake. Much better to be genuine to have that genuine life lived out in faith, visible in worship, so that others can see. So I think a good question for us to ask at this time is how can we worship in this new context in which we find ourselves? So here's my second thought for us, and it's this, expect the unexpected. Now that's a bit of a cliche really, isn't it? Expect the unexpected. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's actually really quite wise advice. I don't suppose that Paul and Silas expected to be spending the night in prison. 
I don't suppose they expected a supernatural earthquake that was going to flow the, throw the prison doors open. But actually, what I'm really thinking about here is the jailer. Now, my son has been studying the Romans at school at the moment, and this week he had to go in one day dressed up as a Roman soldier. And, of course, when you look at the things they had to wear, they looked incredibly impressive in their uniform and their armour. The sort of people you wouldn't want to mess with. Now, I suspect it would have been similar for the jailer, too. This was a man who was used to dealing with violent people, who would show no mercy, who would throw them into prison and make sure they did not get out. A powerful man. Not the sort of man you would expect to show any weakness. And certainly not the sort of man you would expect to be interested in Jesus. But we're told that when the earthquake happened and the prison doors flew open, the jailer came and when he feared that the prisoners may have all escaped, that he was on the verge of committing suicide. Now that is incredible really, that a man so strong and powerful on the outside would have got to the point that he was about to commit suicide. It shows he was full of fear. He had great fear inside. Now that may have been justified. I, I guess maybe he would have lost his life and been executed himself if he'd lost any prisoners. But his first reaction wasn't to check whether they were still there. Um, after all, you know, Paul and Silas were in the stocks as well as the prison doors didn't do that he didn't think of going out to try and find the potentially escaped prisoners he didn't even think about who else he could blame his first reaction was a flood of fear to the extent it was so overwhelming he was about to commit suicide a man full to brimming with fear well rather than face his fears he decided the best thing to do was to take his own life. And sadly, that's true of many men today, and women, of course. Um, we see the horrendous suicide statistics and how it's increasing in this country. It's not good. There are many people who look fine on the outside and yet inside are crumbling and feel broken. And of course, not all of them will attempt suicide. Only a fraction of them will do that. There are many people who seem to be fine, but are really struggling and are looking for a way to escape, a way out of their brokenness. Well, I know I personally am guilty sometimes of pigeonholing people and thinking, oh, they would never be interested in Jesus. Or maybe I don't think that. Maybe I more think there's not much point in saying anything to them. But actually, this is a reminder that we need to expect the unexpected. We don't quite know what happened in that jailer's heart, but we do know he was transformed. So to begin with, he was this jailer who threw them into prison. Maybe it was hearing, overhearing the worship and the, the praying, the singing, maybe hearing a real relationship with God that changed his heart a bit but that when the prison doors were opened and he was full of fear, there was still one thing that helped him. There was like the clincher. Let me read what happens in verse 28. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is probably not how Paul and Silas imagined their night in prison would go. But God had other plans. That is why we should expect the unexpected, particularly when it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus with other people. 
So what can you and I take away from this bit of scripture? Well, I think uh, three things. So the first would be don't judge. It's that classic thing, isn't it, of don't judge a book by its cover. It may be that we tend to pigeonhole people and assume that they wouldn't be interested in Jesus. But Jesus might be interested in them. So let's make sure we don't write people off. Don't judge. The second one is show kindness. Now, it may be that the jailer overheard Paul and Silas singing, maybe. But I think it was an act of kindness that really clinched it for him. Just as he was about to take his own life, Paul shouted out, Don't harm yourself. We are still here. It was that act of kindness in seeking to look after the jailer, I think, that brought him to his knees. We need to make sure that we, as well as not judging, that we show kindness to people. And then there's the third thing, which is be prepared. What I mean is be prepared to talk about Jesus. When that moment comes, an opportunity, because someone opens up, well, what are we going to talk about? Not religion, not philosophy, but about Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Will we be ready? It may not be that somebody falls at our feet and says, what must I do to be saved? How amazing would that be? But whatever the opportunity is that does come our way, will we be ready to talk about Jesus? And that way that we'll be ready for the unexpected. And what an unexpected evening it was for Paul and Silas. Uh, I guess they thought that they would then be in prison for the night, but they end up in the jailer's house. The jailer had started off throwing them into prison and ended up washing their wounds. And Paul baptises his whole household. What an incredible transformation. If we expect the unexpected and ask God, who knows what might happen in our families, with our friends, with our neighbours. If we let God work and offer ourselves to be part of it, we might end up in unexpected but very exciting places. So as we come to a conclusion, let's return to COVID. COVID has changed pretty much every area of life in some way or another. The the crucial question I think for us to consider therefore is how have we as disciples of Jesus adapted to these new circumstances? Will we worship wherever and whenever? We can't worship in church, sing and pray quite like we used to. Things have changed. How has your worship adapted over the past eight months? And how can your worship continue to develop going forward to get stronger? And secondly, will we expect the unexpected? Are we tempted to write people off or to pigeonhole people and assume that they would have nothing to do with Jesus? Or will we be prepared to show kindness, to talk about Jesus as the opportunity arises so that more people can know about Jesus? I personally find those quite searching questions. I hope they're helpful for you. I hope that you will ponder them today in this coming week as we think about how we can best adapt as disciples in these COVID times to be a blessing to others. And let's continue to ask God the Holy Spirit to empower us to be better servants as we follow our Lord Jesus Christ in these strange times.
And now for our prayers. After each prayer this morning, we have a response. Response is, Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For our government, we pray for our government at this time for wisdom and sensitivity as they attempt to manage the spread of the coronavirus by putting in place local restrictions. We pray that these may have the desired effect and that the virus will be brought under control. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We thank you for our health service and pray that they may not be overwhelmed as we move towards winter. We pray for your protection, Father, on those who work on the front line, taking care of our nation's health. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. God of our salvation, you have ordained that we serve you in serving one another. Look upon this nation, burdened at this time of cares and anxieties, with infection, sickness and untimely death. Grant us grace to work together with honest and faithful hearts, each caring for the good of all, that striving first for your kingdom and its righteousness, we may have added to us all the things that we need for our daily sustenance and common good. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And following our recent annual church meeting, we pray for all members of our PCC and Deanery Synod and give you thanks for those who are prepared to serve in this way. We ask that you would give them wisdom and guidance as they make important decisions on our behalf. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For teachers and students, in this half-term week, we pray that all teachers and students will be able to have a good break in which they will be rested and restored. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For our community. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of the Nailsy Community Group, initiated during the first few months of the pandemic, but now as they continue to support our community in so many ways. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the sick and bereaved, Heavenly Father, we bring before you now all who we know who are sick or bereaved. We offer up our hopes and fears, our joys and sorrows to God, our refuge and strength. Lord, listen to our prayers and hear the voice of our supplications as we who trust in your word eagerly await your help, for you are the God of our salvation. This we ask through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now join in the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Well, that brings us almost to the end of today's Church at Home. I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who is involved in putting this Church at Home together. Uh, and now I have some notices for us. The first one is about shoeboxes. And here is a little video from Charlotte to explain. So today I'm going to show us where we can find the information for our shoebox appeal. If you go to Google and you type in link to hope, 
you will find their website. If you just click on their website, you'll see they've got lots of different things going on. But we want to click on the top bit that says Shoebox Appeal and then Shoebox Registration 2020. Now there are two options this year. You can fill a shoebox or they will fill a shoebox for you. Now if you click on you fill a shoebox, you will find the information that you will need for this year's shoebox appeal. Now you need to then click on the bit that says shoebox appeal 2020 leaflet and that will take you to a page that shows you the leaflet that I would usually give you. And here you can print it off. It tells you what you need to put in either a family shoebox or an elderly shoebox. And you can print it off, fill it out, attach a two pound coin and a one pound coin, and then bring your shoebox to church. If you'd rather not fill a shoebox this year, you can choose the option of Link to Hope filling a shoebox for you. So you go to the same tab and um, choose We Fill a Shoebox. Now you can read the information on this page, really simple. You can fill out this form. Um, you can also put in the, uh, the comment bit at the bottom uh, what you would like in a card um, and what you would like to say. And I think you can also attach a picture um, as well and so people would see who that shoebox is from like you would do when you sometimes make a shoebox for yourself and that is it I hope this video has been helpful for you and you can re-watch it um, later on if you are planning on making your own shoeboxes this year you will need to deliver them to the church by the 4th of November you can do this on Wednesday the 21st of October, Wednesday the 28th of October or Wednesday the 4th of November between 10.30 and 12. You can also deliver them on Sunday the 25th of October between 4 and 5pm. The 4th of November will be the last date for us to receive the boxes um, as we will need to deliver them uh, to Bristol. But thank you so much. Uh, please do get in touch with me if you'd like any um, advice or any questions um, I'd love to be able to help you and yeah I hope that we will be able to share um, some love this year uh, through these boxes so thank you thank you so much Charlotte the other notice I have for us this morning is about prayer and praise uh, our next prayer and praise is on the 4th of November uh, if you would like to join us for that and you don't already receive the emails for prayer and praise then do contact the office and they will be happy to help you to link up for our prayer and praise. Speaking of prayer let me just pray for us all now. Father thank you for the time that we've been able to spend together this morning. Thank you that we have been able to worship you. I pray that you would be with us this week. I pray that you would help us to discern how we might be being called to adapt as disciples in these current times. I pray that you would challenge us in that this week. In Jesus' name, Amen. And that brings us to the end of our church at home. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Uh, goodbye and God bless. Thank you.